but there have been lots of new donors coming in. Uh, for example, China is now a major player, including in Africa. There are many charitable foundations that play an important role, certainly in particular sectors like the health sector, where the Gates Foundation is now one of the, if not the largest uh, donor. What uh, has happened is in, since the economic crisis, uh, there's been a great uh, problem with, uh, with getting funding and facing a number of other challenges that are related to uh, the neoliberal kind of tightening of, uh, of funds for social change. And so I'm here to talk about some of the challenges in community organizing and how we might be able to, uh, to address them, ideally by sort of expanding the diversity of our, of our funding sources, including both the public sector and civil society and, uh, and the private sector. Many donors now are doing what other donors, including the U.S., often have done, is where they see the giving aid also a part of their foreign policy to promote international objectives, to promote their own economy, and that certainly for donors like the Netherlands, uh, many of the Nordic donors, Canada, these have implied quite big, uh, big changes. Very strongly believe in this connectivity between those three pillars: trade, investment, and development. Also, an opportunity yeah, for, for, for countries that you, if you already uh, do good or you are specialize yourself in this part of the value chain, you can be successful. But then you have to integrate, otherwise, you can never be part of a value chain. But the question, of course, arises is this a sustainable growth? And what was the role of aid and trade? And what can be the role of aid and trade? That the private sector is playing an increasingly important role. Not just like not just the foundations like the Gates Foundations, but actually commercial companies that are now playing a growing role. Um, we increasingly see concentration processes in global production. So large corporations set up global value chains. They don't produce in-house everything they want to make, but they buy it across the world. So they set up global value chains and they define the standards for these uh, companies and say, okay, you have to deliver this quality at that time, at that price. So, at, and then they define the social and environmental conditions, etc., to be fulfilled. So what does that mean for developing countries? You really have to take into account how you make this a really uh, beneficial or profitable investment for a region or a country as a whole. So think in a broader development picture. If you we think that we have to develop the services because we, are, we don't have very much uh, natural resources. There is a growing interest within private companies to not only make a commercial profit, but also provide social goods, provide public goods, provide goods that are good for the environment, for example. And I'm very interested to hear your comments on regionalism as a way of protecting the openness of small economies. It's so um, the question that I ask then is how can we work with these big companies, these so-called lead firms, to make value chains more inclusive and to make more of it for, for local companies. So how can we harness the positive things and avoid that people are kind of dropped or crowded out of these value chains? Countries which are small are very vulnerable to uh, the outside forces, and we have seen that also in Cape Verde. Uh at the same time, a lot of the uh, non-governmental organizations uh, that have existed for a long time are also working to make their products more and the way they operate more economically uh, viable, uh, building on the example for ex of, of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh that, that provides loans to poor people. And these are also now products that, and ways of doing business that become of interest for commercial, uh, for commercial banks. It became so much of a shock for Kaper because um, the country did not assume a phasing out attitude towards uh, development aid from the beginning. It saw it as something that would be never ending, so it, uh, it put itself in the international scene as a receiver of aid and not so much as a country who had prepared itself to eventually grow out of aid. So when graduation came, it, it came as this big shock. So it, it, it's also the responsibility of the country to take it not as a penalty, but as a, as a milestone in its development um, path. So the, 
there is somewhat longer experience. I mentioned Grameen Bank that has shown that, that uh, these are approaches that can work, can work for poor people and can be to a great extent commercially, uh, commercially viable. Many of the, the newer approaches are, as we said, I mean, they, they are new and the experience is, is fairly recent. One of the most interesting uh, aspects of it for people, where people say they work in private companies, is that those new approaches allow them to infuse their business practices with values around, uh, around more equality, around diversity, for, uh, for, for example. In the area of development, what you see is that this new approach shifts the view of what used to be called beneficiaries, the beneficiaries of the programs now become the owners of what they produce. They, they get the real economic stake, so they become, they become the producers rather than the, uh, the beneficiaries. So, uh, so I th Finding ways to ensure the continuation of the dynamic development achieved in 40 years of independence is primarily a responsibility of Cabo Verde and Cape Verde. However, the international community has a highly important role to play in this context. A shared responsibility is at stake for us. So I think what you see because of the changes in international development and because of the way private companies, many private companies are changing, that there's a convergence of uh, objectives and therefore new ways of uh, collaboration are emerging.